Um, my name is Amy oxendale Imig, and I have the privilege of serving as our Director of Campus Ministry here. Um, will you join me in uh, prayer as we enter into worship, praising our great God? God, we praise you. We praise you for who you are, that you are Father, that you are Son, that you are Holy Spirit, that you are things beyond our comprehension, that you are mysterious, a God that we can't control or understand, that you're a God who is gracious, a God whose unconditional love covers all of his creation, and that you are a God who is not far off, but you are a God who is near, that you are near to us in the ins and outs of our days, you are near to us in our grief and emptiness, in our depression and pain. You are near to us in our joy and our deep longing and the hope that we have, whether we can name what it is or not. God, we come to you today, wherever we are, and seek you. We seek your face. We seek to hear your voice. We seek to know more of who you are, this mysterious God that we worship, that we long to glorify, and that we give our praise to today in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you join me in the call to worship? It's from Micah, Psalms, combination. Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he might teach us his ways and that we may walk in his path. I was glad when he said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. When they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's set our eyes and our hearts and our minds on the Lord. Sing with us, be thou my vision. Oh 
set our eyes on Jesus Christ. This is who he is, our great God of the universe, the one and only one who is worthy of our praise, who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. our eternal song. time we sing. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Can you believe it? That you would take my place. This is what he's done. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. sin and death. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, you set me on a place. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, 
listen to these words. Listen to these words. That he has set us free. That he has conquered the grave. And that he has done it for us. The psalmist says, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. He has gone to the depth for us so that we may come boldly before him. And this morning, I want to invite you in an attitude of prayer, in an attitude of confession, to come before the Father. And we're going to read Psalm 15. And as you hear these words of Psalm 15, it says, Who may ascend? We know that Christ Jesus, our Savior, ascended the hill of Calvary for us so that we may come to him blameless and pure and righteous. It's unbelievable, truly unbelievable, that this is our gift from the Savior. So we come boldly confessing our sin, and I want to invite you just to hear these words from Psalm 15, and then we're going to confess uh, confess our sins this morning. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eye a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. And this morning, we could never, we could never stand up to this. We could never count ourselves as one of these. And yet, Jesus Christ in himself offers us the opportunity to be his. And so I invite you this morning to just confess your sin, maybe where where you have, um, in your heart of hearts, where you have fallen short of these things that the psalmist asked. Let's just quietly uh, confess our sin before. But God. We were lost in our sin, but God. You intervened on our behalf. You came to seek us and to save us so that we this morning may stand pure and blameless in your sight. And you have sealed us as your own. Father, we come and we give you thanks for that. And this is all for your glory and for your praise. Your grace, your riches of love that you have poured out on us. Coming to seek and to save us from the misery of our sin. We stand knowing this morning that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Behold him this morning. Through Jesus we pray. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms Blessings on the spoon for pure and blameless in his sight, he destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through the sun eternally. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, to the praise of your glory.
the word of Christ for us. Come praise and glorify our God, for we believe the word. And through our faith we have a seen the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done. Until we join it in the space to God the people. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen indeed. We worship a God who saves and offers us a salvation unto eternity. We are living eternally now if we are walking in, in faith and step with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is an important hope for us to cling to. Um, indeed, particularly this week as our church family has, has lost one of its dear and beloved saints, uh, Dr. Julius Scott, who passed away on Thursday. Uh, we, we acknowledge that, uh, indeed, our grief is great uh, at the loss here, and certainly for, for his family, for Florence. And, uh, and, but we also know that uh, he celebrates. He uh, is enjoying the full fruit of eternal life with Jesus right now. We're going to be gathering as a church to celebrate that hope and to bring our grief before the Lord on Thursday, this Thursday, right here in Graham Chapel. We'll have uh, social distancing, we'll have masks, um, but we're wanting to come together. We're also going to live stream the service as well, so uh, you won't have to miss out on that. That's 1030 on Thursday. Uh, and so, uh, but with that same hope, with that same grace, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. So I invite you just to bow your heads and let's come before this God of, of salvation, this God of hope uh, together. Would you please pray with me? Father, what would we do if death got the last word? What would we do if our sin that, that so easily entangles us uh, never went anywhere? We've tried to be better and it doesn't work. But Father, what a gift that you have given us in Jesus Christ. What, what a hope that we have. Our sin washed away as far as the east is from the west. You look upon us and you now see the righteousness of Christ clothing us. And therefore now we enjoy and celebrate fellowship with you. Whether this has been a, a good week where we felt your closeness, or whether we have not walked with you, we've walked far away, God, the invitation is the same because your victory is the same. And we thank you for that, God. And this morning, we do celebrate your faithfulness, particularly over our recent high school and college graduates, God, who ended their school years under the pall of the coronavirus with, with their classes disrupted, having to be separated from their dear friends, but Father, we honor the way that they overcame the challenge and finished strong. And now we pray for them as they turn their eyes to what's next, towards college, but beginning in a way that no one would have expected. Or for those who are looking for jobs and they're just not hard, they're not easy to find. We ask you would calm their fears, Holy Spirit. God, renew in them the joy of their salvation and armor them in the knowledge you are always faithful. We pray for our schools, Father, trying to make decisions about the upcoming school year. We ask you grant them great wisdom. You give them prudence to know how to both educate their students and care for their teachers and their staff well. It's not easy, Father. 
We pray for our members uh, at Christ Community who are school teachers, coaches, and administrators facing a semester that's going to demand more from them than ever before. So fortify them, Holy Spirit, right now we pray with an uncommon strength for the task that's before them. And renew in them, God, even now a desire to see their classrooms, their schools claimed for the kingdom of God. We pray for Montreat College, on whose campus we regularly meet and worship. The school that seeks to be a lighthouse for Christ-centered education, God. We know that with, with another record enrollment on the way, God, we pray that you would provide great clarity and wisdom to their leadership and faculty and staff as they learn how to welcome students in this new season. Help them to know how to care for their students while discharging their gospel mission. And we ask that nothing would stand in your way for giving these students a vision of kingdom life, life lived with you. We pray for the salvation that will happen because students are brought to this place. And so we pray in that light for our ministry to this college campus. We pray for the gospel to go forth from our community into the lives in the, of these students. and Help us to know how to come alongside them in this difficult time. Those who are coming from near and those who are coming from every corner of the globe. Help us to know how to disciple the next generation in the name of Jesus. We pray for our members who serve at the college, God, asking you to supply them grace for the work in the year at hand. And we pray for our campus ministry director, Amy, for her ministry, that you would strengthen her, provide for her in every way as she shepherds us into ministering to this next generation. Father, we know that you've often brought teachers into our lives at the right moment in ways that have shaped us forever, the ways that make us who we are today. And in that light, there's no counting the impact that your, your child, Dr. Julius Scott, had on so many students over a lifetime dedicated to telling your story and pointing to Jesus. Father, we grieve. We miss him. We miss losing one who told the story so well. And, and we ask the full measure of grace over Florence and her family. But God, we celebrate. We do celebrate, as Julius certainly is right in this very moment, the great and eternal hope of Jesus Christ to which his life always pointed. Spirit, we ask that you would help us to live lives that point to Jesus, that tell the story faithfully in every way. And we acknowledge we need your help. We need you to do that in us so that you might do it through us. And we ask for this in the power of the Spirit and in the very strong name of Jesus. Amen. We are a people called, each and every one of us sent, to tell the story of Jesus Christ, to make much of Him. And so this morning, our offering is always a chance to rededicate ourselves to that. Uh, there, on their screen is a way that you can dedicate financially your gifts to the mission and ministry of this church. We cannot thank you enough for the ways those gifts continue to resource ministry through our, our staff, through our local mission partners, and through our missionaries across the globe. But God, we, are, we ask that God would continue to bless you to also be a part of sharing that ministry, of telling that story to those around you. Uh, and again, it still looks different now, um, but th that doesn't mean you don't have opportunities this week. And so may we lay all that we are before the Lord this morning as we worship him with our tithes and our offerings. Who am I that the highest king would rest? But he brought me in all his love for me. All his love for me. When the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free. He has ransomed me, His grace is shown still. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus.
Father, we are reminded this morning of what we once were, a slave to sin, dead in our transgressions. But Jesus, you died for us and have given us a new identity. Paul tells us that if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Lord, we are not, um, we are not unaware that this is a hard calling that you have called us to. The freedom is wonderful, yes, but spirit, empower us for the obedience to take up our, our cross and to follow Jesus. We thank you again, Jesus, for your example, your humility and your meekness in submitting to the Father. And we would do so again this morning because you have called us children and you have made us yours. Our hearts are full of gratitude and we give you praise. Amen. One of my favorite authors and speakers is Paul David Tripp, and he, he writes about how the whole purpose of camping is to make a person long for a home. Uh, he says the, that first day in the camp or in the woods, uh, you're putting up the tent, it's, it's exciting. But three days later, your tent is sagging, leaking, and has unpleasant odors you just can't explain. You love the taste of food cooked over an open fire. Um, But three days later, you're tired of foraging for food and you're irritated by how fast it burns. You are excited at the prospect of of catching dinner every night from the the stream that flows by your your, uh, campsite, which was reported to have, uh, was teeming with trout. Uh, But all you seem to snag were tree roots uh, on the bottom. And now you're four days in, your back hurts, there seems to be no more wood to forage, and you're tired of keeping the fire going anyway. And you look into that 
once ice and food filled cooler and all that remains are steaks that have turned gray and are oozing uh, in a pool of blood stained water. <laughs> well, suddenly you begin to think and fondly of home. And you just hope somebody will break the silence and say, hey, why don't we go home? <laughs> well, your four days in the wilderness have accomplished their mission. They have prepared you to appreciate home. Jesus looks into the faces of some weary disciples who are still camping out in this world, so to speak, and he begins to speak of home. Let's look at this from John, uh, John's Gospel. I'm going to begin in chapter 13, verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say also to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Let not your hearts be troubled. You know, Jesus is a realist. He understands that we live in a world of trouble. In fact, later on, uh, we read chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Well, what was this world of trouble facing the disciples? Uh, well, a major plank of their trouble uh, was that Jesus was leaving them in the world. And, uh, you know, the, camping, the camp out was going to continue for them, and they could not go home with Jesus. If you can remember as a child... Uh, being left by your parents as they went out, uh, you, you may remember feeling that distress. You know, what's going to happen to me? Who's going to stay with us? You know, the disciples are troubled by the prospect here of being left behind by Jesus in this world. But Jesus also speaks a rather troublesome word about them, about the disciples. Judas will betray him. Peter deny him. And other gospel accounts tell us, Jesus says, you will all abandon me. Looking into these sad uh, faces of his disciples, Jesus comforts them first by acknowledging their world of trouble. Let not your hearts be troubled. Now, there's a bit of an issue here because this same word trouble is used of Jesus himself and just... Of course, they're at a, at a dinner here. It's, it was used of him just minutes earlier. Back in chapter 13, verse 21, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. He's troubled because Judas was about to betray him. Well, is it okay if Jesus is troubled, but we are not? Well, troubles can strike us deep in our spirits. We're not unfeeling sticks and stones, and Jesus wasn't either. But don't miss the jewel that is here. Jesus knows what it's like to hurt, to be deeply troubled. We, we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. He knows what it is to be weak and vulnerable and hurt. But the point that Jesus is making for us in chapter 14, verse 1, is that we are not to allow trouble to seize command of our hearts. Don't let trouble overtake you as the, the operating system of your life. See, Jesus was troubled, but what, 
what commanded his heart was obedience to the Father and love for his own. Now, it's a pretty easy guess that there are numerous things troubling you uh, and me. Uh, I mean, what with this virus uh, still afoot, uh, the economy, politics, uh, the startup again of work, school, life, seems everywhere we turn, there's, there's a world of trouble. But the problem with us is our trouble gets compounded because we can easily let our troubles live rent-free in our heads so that trouble is all we think about all the time. And it doesn't help at all to know the statistics on trouble, does it? Uh, I was reading uh, a study uh, on worry. You know, worry makes us miserable. Worry sucks the joy out of life. But here's the deal. 91% of what we worry about never actually happens. 91%. Yeah, but what worries us is what? The 9% that does happen to us. And that 9% can take over the heart 100%. Well, this is what Jesus is speaking to. Don't let your hearts be overwhelmed by trouble. Now, to help us with this, Jesus gives us a promise, and it's the promise of heaven. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. You know, well, every good Jew believed in God. But notice here how Jesus puts himself on the level with God. Believe also in me. That is a radical statement. Well, what are we to believe about God and Jesus? That they are in league together, making a home for us. In my Father's house are many rooms. King James, of course, has mansions. Uh, but Jesus says, in my Father's house, many rooms. And I'm leaving this world, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And what Jesus is envisioning for us here is that God is, is something like a, a Middle Eastern a father who has a really big house and he just keeps adding on rooms to the compound because he can't stand the thought of his children living anywhere else but with himself. Well, Jesus promises his people a place in the Father's house. Now, perhaps for some, this whole promise of heaven is not a really helpful comfort as, as you're dealing with the troubles of, of your life. Uh, perhaps focusing on heaven seems rather escapist. Or perhaps, if we're really honest, boring. Uh, Stephen King has spent his career writing novels uh, on the theme of death. In an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, he was asked, do you want to go to heaven? And he said this, I don't want to go to the heaven I learned about when I was a kid. It seems boring to me. He said, the idea that you're going to go lounge around on a cloud all day and listen to guys play harps, I don't want to listen to harps. I want to listen to Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> well, you know, here's my, well, it might be a mistake to allow cartoons uh, comic books, and even well-intentioned but misinformed Sunday school teachers to color our thinking about heaven. I'm probably not the only one here, but, but I'm 100% I'm with Stephen King. I don't want to go to that kind of heaven either. Well, fortunately, no such heaven is actually described in the Bible. Heaven will be a physical place, a new heavens and a new earth where there is a glorious city with river, trees, great food, and amazing adventures. Paul talks about how we're going to judge angels. And we are going to rule with Jesus over this new world. You know, the God who made life and the adventures of this world, adventures that are so thrilling to us, he is not going to bore us in the world to come with harp recitals. You know, no disrespect to those of you who play the harp or love harp music, you know. <laughs> Well, Jesus does not speak of harps. He speaks of a home. And when he does, he is tapping into something so deep in the human heart. I've read John 14 at, at many, many funerals. 
And what makes John 14 so appealing is not that it gives us this detailed description of heaven. Uh, we get a little bit more detail like in Revelation 21, 22. But John 14 simply speaks of home. You and I are wired for home. This is perhaps the deepest longing in us. And not just at the end of a of a camping trip or a hard day. C.S. Lewis says there have been times when I think we do not desire heaven, but more often I find myself wondering whether in our heart of hearts we have ever desired anything else. It is the secret signature of each soul, the incommunicable and unappeasable want. You know, we all want to live high, we, we want to love life, enjoy life, and, and a lot of that centers around our home. And you know, whatever the highest high that you could attain, and, and that's, that's home. That is your longing for heaven. That is your longing to be in the, in the house of God. Lewis goes on to say, he says, this longing, it's the thing we desired before we met our wives or made friends or chose our work and which we shall still desire on our deathbeds when the mind no longer knows wife or friends or work. My granddad spent his final years in a nursing home in Fredericksburg, Texas, uh, and with dementia. But uh, he became quite the escape artist the, uh, the last several years of his life. And it amuses me a bit to think of, of this young staff there at the, at the uh, nursing home chasing him around as he slipped through doors and windows and, and out into the parking lot. And, of course, what he was after was he was checking cars to see if there was an open car. Why? So he could go home. Ever since we lost our home in the, in the Garden of Eden, home has been the deepest longing of our hearts. And whether you've had a good home or a lousy home, still every one of us, we are seeking what? For that, that place of safety, that place of welcome, where there's love, laughter, a place with loved ones where we can kick back, we can be ourselves, and, and all is just good. In my Father's house, the first thing Jesus speaks to help us deal with our troubles in this life is the Father's house. We have a home. And what that means, of course, is that our troubles in this world, they will not be the final word on our lives. Home will be the Father's home. But it's not just that there's a place. We are wanted in that home. You know, perhaps we, we know the uh, feeling like a stranger in our own home, or the you know, home is not really, we, we want to be there, but we're not really loved or accepted. I mean, we, we, we hear stories of that, and perhaps we've experienced that, but that is not the case of our Father's home. See, Jesus not only promises us a place, and he's, that He's going to prepare a place for us, but he says, no, I am in pursuit of you. I'm coming back for you that where I am, you may be also. He wants us with him. We're the desire of his heart. Listen again to uh, verse 3 in chapter 14. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you where? Not to a house, to a place. I will take you to myself. Jesus prays a little bit later. We'll come to this several weeks from now, but he prays, John 17, verse 24, Father, I desire. Do you know what the deepest desire of Jesus' heart is? It is you, Christian. I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. In effect, Jesus is saying that he, he doesn't want heaven without us. There's an incompleteness in him apart from us. And there is an incompleteness in you apart from him. Jesus goes and prepares a place for us. You know, we, uh, 
We read in our confession of sin earlier uh, from Psalm 15. And, uh, you know, who can, uh, let me get this here before us, who can, uh, who, shall show, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Well, God's tent, God's holy hill, that's his temple. You know, David long uh, ago said, oh, that I could just go sit in the, in the temple of the Lord, sit in God's presence. And our know, call to worship was why? To, to dwell, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. There's this deep longing in the Old Testament just to, to be in God's presence. Well, Psalm 15 is saying, okay, so how do you get in? How do you get into the tent? How do you get onto that holy hill, into his house? Well, those who walk blamelessly and who do what is right, who speak the truth in their heart, well, right there, that disqualifies every one of us. But Jesus has gone to prepare a place. And the way he is preparing that place is by going to the cross. Because that is going to move away, that's to move sin out of the way. And so Jesus prepares the place, but then he comes in absolute pursuit of you and me, Christian. We are his bride. We are the desire of his heart. Jesus loves his own, and he loves them to the end. And his end is that he may love us forever. And so he will in the Father's house. Well, all this is great, I mean. But how does this help us now? in this world of troubles. I mean, can't, can't thinking of heaven just be some escapist, you know, flight, uh, a fancy flight from trouble? You know, maybe being so heavenly minded makes us of no earthly good. We've heard that before. But that is not true. In fact, it's just the opposite. The truth is that unless we are heavenly minded, we will be of little earthly good. See, unless we look at our troubles in the light of, of the promise and the hope of heaven, well, we may, we may crash and burn. Why? Because we may cling to this earthly life thinking that this is all that matters. But we're clinging to a sinking ship. But when we are convinced that heaven is our true home, there is a power in that that can enable us to hold loosely the things of this life and to sacrifice, to give away our resources for the sake of the kingdom, to share our homes with others. And we do so precisely because we know, we understand that this life and all this stuff that, that we hold, we're only holding it for a few minutes in the grand scope of eternity. And so we can let it go. You know, throughout history, Christians who did great things for this present troubled world were exactly those who thought most of the next. You know, the apostles who laid the foundation for the conversion of the Roman Empire, the, uh, the great people who built up the Middle Ages, uh, the, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, they all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. They knew that they had just a few short years in this world and someday they would give an accounting to God in his house. And so they, they wanted to run in the works of the kingdom, be faithful uh, in those works. And so they, with zeal and sacrifice and purpose, they gave themselves, again, fundamentally knowing that this world was not their final home. The Father's house was. Professor Todd Whitmore from Notre Dame traveled to Uganda uh, after 20 years had ravaged, uh, of war had ravaged that country. And uh, he went to uh, a refugee camp uh, in northern Uganda because he wanted to study uh, one of the displaced people that had, had gathered there, uh, the Akoli people. And what he found in the camps was that scores of Christians had also moved into those camps. They had left their homes in other places and moved in with the Akoli people, these refugees, to help them. And Whitmore wrote that the most practical and helpful workers among the Akoli were also the most heavenly minded. You see, they worked with hope because their focus on this world of trouble really was on the promises and the hope of heaven and Jesus to come. 
You know, I, I find it fascinating that Jesus' first word to his troubled disciples to help them navigate their troubles, his first word was about heaven. I don't know about you, but I know I don't think about heaven enough these days, unless, you know, a loved one dies or we've had a really bad day and just, just want to go home, but that borders on escapist thinking. But if Jesus puts this first, perhaps we should be thinking more deeply about how a mind and a heart that is filled with the joy and the hope of our heavenly home, how that should now influence us and how we handle, how we navigate the troubles of daily life. Well, this week, start. Start somewhere, you know. <laughs> Just pick one trouble in your life and start looking at it through the hope of heaven. And what does the promise of heaven bring to the table to help shape you as you deal with troubles? How might... How might your hope and this promise of heaven make you more hopeful, more joyful, generous, less anxious, more focused? Jesus Christ wants his people to be heavenly minded as they camp out and navigate through the troubles of this life. Are we? As we respond to this word today, I want to just invite you to take a moment. We're going to end the service by singing Psalm 84, but I want to invite you to consider. I want you, I want you to consider heaven. I want you to fix your eyes upon your dwelling place with him. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you do not know the hope of heaven. And we want to invite you into that place to where you know the highways to Zion, as the psalmist says. So as, as Pastor Richard has offered, I invite you to um, set your troubles in light of heaven and in light of the Christ who says, peace, be still. Do not let your heart be troubled. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose hearts are the highway to Zion. Hear these words. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, appearing before God in Zion. Let's fix our eyes on heaven. Thank you.
Because of Jesus Christ, we're going to have thousands of days in that house with the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. But until then, we are camping out in this world, aren't we? <laughs> with a promise and hope of, of our Father's home. Uh, what an encouraging word of the Lord Jesus. And uh, may you be encouraged and built up as you continue navigating the troubles of, of this life. Uh, my brothers and sisters, receive the, the blessing of the Lord now. May God bless you and keep you. The Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, turn his face towards you and grant you peace. And he does and he will forever through Jesus Christ, our coming Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Go in peace.